For the few moments that are ours this morning, I want you to prayerfully ponder the thought, good trouble. Good trouble. These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Good trouble. I know it doesn't look like it now, but when I was a little boy, I stayed in trouble. <laughs> the polished man you see before you now is, <laughs> is not an indicator of the trouble that I caused when I was a little boy. Trouble was something that was easy to get into. Um, there were a lot of rules growing up when I was in. Don't touch this. Can't say this. Can't go here. Can't go there. I can recall staying in trouble. Not a whole lot of big trouble, like police trouble. Thank God for that. But you know, the discipline kind of trouble where mama and daddy always, daddy had to bail out and mama was always threatening. <laughs> that kind of trouble. You know, the trouble in school where you had to sit at the principal. I know most of y'all never been to the principal's office, but <laughs> my wife ain't never been to the principal's office, y'all. Y'all pray for me. I said, me and my principal had a unique uh, appreciation for one another. Uh, my teachers and I, I loved them to death, but they could pick me out of a lineup if trouble was going on in the classroom. <laughs> Somehow, some way, I was directly or indirectly uh, connected to the trouble that went on. I don't know, it was just, it was just easy. It was, trouble was exciting to me. I, mean, I don't know about y'all, it was, it did <laughs> It was exciting to me, and I wanted to be in the midst of everything that was going on. Um, so, 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 so from a very early age, I understood what trouble was. I understood. I really did understand. I, I understood what it meant to cause trouble. I, I, like I said, I knew what it meant to cause trouble. I knew how to stay in trouble. Um, never figured out how to stay out of trouble, but, but I knew how to stay in trouble. Um, Growing up, trouble never had a positive connotation to it. it. It was never a positive experience. Trouble was always followed by punishment. So I always associated trouble to, to problems, to difficulty, to worry, to inconvenience to distress, to irritation. Trouble was never, ever, ever, never uh, seen as something positive or something good. So to my uh, bewilderment, the text this morning showed me something I'd never seen before. I've seen this text before, but it never showed this particular verse to me in a way that I want to share with you this morning. It says, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Let me, let me paint the picture for you just real quick. Paul, Silas, the other disciples are, are in the city and um, they are evangelizing, teaching, preaching Jesus. And the text says this young slave girl who had a spirit of divination on her. She was able to fortune tell. Um, she followed around Paul and Silas and other disciples talking about uh, mocking them, saying Jesus is the way to salvation. And after a few days, Paul got aggravated with this young woman following her around and cast that spirit of divination out of her. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. And that spirit of divination came out of that slave girl. And the slave girl's owners were now upset because their cash cow was gone. Their 
the goose that laid the golden egg was now gone. They couldn't make any more money off this young woman who was fortune telling through the spirit of divination. And they were so upset with Paul and Silas and the other disciples for, for going around the city teaching, preaching Jesus, and for uh, casting out the spirit of divination. They grabbed them, magistrate, that's a name for a city official. They grabbed them and they took them to the center of the city and they accused them of, of um, ruining their good thing. And they influenced the officials and the other uh, people in the, in the city to such a degree that they, they beat Paul and Silas and threw them in jail. And when you read verse 20, it's their accusation that Paul and Silas were causing trouble in the city. These dudes are making trouble in my city because they are teaching things that are not lawful to be taught because they're Jews and we're Romans. I might get into that a little later, but I thought it was interesting how Paul is a Roman citizen and they didn't know that and Paul didn't tell them that. And if you read down the text, Paul pulls that out later like a trump card. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm also a Roman citizen. So just when you get a chance, if I know you guys love to study the Bible and history like I do, so you just, I know you can't wait to get home and read that, so I want you, I don't want to spoil the ending for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what happened is that they were teaching Jesus, and beloved, believe it or not, teaching Jesus is trouble. Preaching Jesus is trouble. Talking about Jesus is trouble. They said they were causing trouble in the city. I don't know if Paul and Silas understood, but the trouble that they were in was good trouble. Good trouble. My aim today is to show you what this good trouble looks like. You know, because we're living in an age now where teaching Jesus can get you in trouble. Oh, man, y'all come on. Uh, teaching, preaching Jesus can get you in trouble. Talking about Jesus can get you in trouble. And, and for that reason alone, many, many, many believers shy away from talking, sharing the message of Jesus Christ because they don't want to get in trouble. And you know in today's cancel culture, if you talk about Jesus, you can get canceled. You can be kicked out, kicked off, lose your job, lose your livelihood. Um, Jesus can get you in trouble. But, but let me say this to you. If you're talking about Jesus and it gets you in trouble, it's good trouble. Can, can, can I say, uh, trouble nonetheless, but it's, it's good trouble. It's trouble worth getting into. You, you know, you, know you, have to, you have to ponder whether the trouble is worth the, 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 the punishment. But let me say to you that, that if you mess around with Jesus, anything you say on his behalf could get you in trouble, but it's worth getting in trouble. It, it's worth getting in trouble. Uh, if you talk about Jesus and people don't like you, it's, it's worth the trouble. If you make people uncomfortable because of your beliefs, it's, it's worth the trouble. Uh, I'm not talking about beating anybody up with your beliefs because, you know, we talk about uh, sharing your beliefs. Um, I'm not going to beat you over the head with Jesus. I'm just going to try to love you to death with Jesus. Some of you will get that when you get home. Um, and, and, and if that makes you uncomfortable, if that causes you trouble, then let me say to you, um, that's a good place to be. Okay, good trouble. And, and the reason I understand um, very few of us like to, to really uh, do this thing where we, we, we talk about good trouble is because we've been conditioned not to cause trouble. From early on, we've been conditioned not to cause trouble. Don't you dare get in trouble 
down there at that school. Don't you get in trouble at work. Don't you, don't you get in trouble with friends and family. Don't you get in trouble. So don't you be a troublemaker. Amen, amen. They couldn't say that about me. <laughs> but we tend to shy away from Jesus. But I want to share something with you. The late Congressman John Lewis um, talked about getting in good trouble. He talked about getting in good trouble to redeem the, the soul of America. He talked about trouble was worth getting into when it had a purpose, when it had a goal. Let me tell you, good trouble when it comes to the church is godly trouble. Okay. See, if, if I was going to paint this picture, I'm, I'm going to get that. I don't, I don't want y'all to be too bored with me. Don't, don't, don't fall asleep yet. Don't, don't start scrolling yet. The, the real issue about this getting in trouble was it was a socioeconomical uh, issue in the community. Anytime you start messing with people's money, <laughs> anytime you start messing with people's livelihood, see, see that, that the slave girl was, was, was there, was, was the money. Anytime you start disrupting folks' money, you cause trouble. And, and, and when the disciples stopped her, uh, the leaders saw the disciples as troublemakers. And they said, we're going to have to do something about these troublemakers. He said, we're going to have to do something. He said, they, they, they trouble in our city. What shall we do? Oh, um, well, let, let me show you what good trouble looks like. He said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to grab them and beat them. And we're going to put them in jail. We're going to grab them, we're going to beat them, we're going to put them in jail, and that's going to teach them a lesson about causing trouble in our city. Yeah. Good trouble, beloved, will expose you to persecution. I, there's no way around it. If you're going to cause trouble, you, you're going to go through some things. I, there's no other way I can say it. Verses 22 through 24. Verses 22 through 24. Uh, the multitude rose up against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes, commanding them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet to stocks. The people had become so upset because of the trouble the disciples had caused, they beat them, ripped their clothes off, beat them, and threw them in prison. Their good trouble landed them in trouble. The disciples were being persecuted because of trouble. Anytime you cause trouble for Jesus, you should expect persecution. You should, be, you should expect that people are not excited about your, your sharing of Jesus. People ain't excited when you talk about Jesus. People ain't excited when you challenge their faith. What I'm trying to say to you is that you should expect some people not to like you if you start talking about Jesus. You should, you should expect haters if you are talking about Jesus. If you are preaching, teaching Jesus, you should expect somebody to not like what you're saying. The crowd didn't like what the disciples were saying. So they beat them and they put them in prison. They were under persecution. The mere thought of persecution stops many of us from saying anything. If we thought something bad was going to happen to us, we would keep our mouths closed. If church was, a, if, if they were watching us coming in and out of the building, people wouldn't come to church. If they were counting how many cars are in the parking lot, saying, how many, look how many people are coming to church. If they harass you on your job for coming to church, you'd stop coming. 
if they, if they made your life uncomfortable for coming to church, you'd stop coming. See, we don't like persecution. We don't like to talk about it. But persecution happens anytime you talk about Jesus. This, this, is, this is the good part. So, so now they're in trouble, and trouble has placed them in persecution. Now, now they're in jail. But what we didn't see, what I didn't see, is that the jail had purpose. I didn't understand what Jesus was, I didn't understand the text until I looked at it. The jail was positioning them for God's purpose. So I'm being beat, being whipped, being shackled, being tossed into the deepest part of the prison so God can use me. We, we, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get, I know we're getting short winded, I'm gonna get right to the point and then get, 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 to, the, get to the shouting part. See, see what happens is the prison was the position that God wanted them in the whole time. If I look at verse 25 and 28, they were shackled Paul and Silas began singing, began singing. They had a midnight prayer service, a watch night service. At midnight, an earthquake came and the jail began to shake and rock and the, the shackles were opened and the doors were opened and the prisoners were going to run. And because the jailer who was put in charge was commissioned by them saying, make sure they stay secure. He understood if they escaped, they were going to kill him. That's why he took out his sword and he was about to kill himself because if they escaped, he was going to have to pay for, with his life. Yeah. So you read the text and he says he was going to pull out his sword. And he was going to kill himself. And Paul and I said, hold on a minute. Don't do nothing. We are all still here. What I'm saying is is that they had been positioned for God's purpose. The trouble was a setup for God's purpose. Everything they had gone through was for God's purpose. They had been beaten for God's purpose. They had their clothes torn for God's purpose. They had been cast in a, in a prison for God's purpose. The earthquake was God's purpose. The miraculous breakout was God's purpose. And you're saying, why? God wanted to save the Philippian jailer. And the Bible says not only he got saved, his entire family got saved. You read all the way down through there. It says his entire family got saved. When they were about to break out, Paul and Silas said, sir, we, we, we're not going anywhere. He ran to them. He said, sir, what must I do to be saved? They were put there for his salvation. And y'all looking at me strange. Like, what does this mean to me? Sometimes God will put you in trouble to get someone else saved. See, the trouble you're in ain't just for you. That's what I'm trying to relay to you. Is that they didn't see that the trouble that they were in was good trouble because someone would be saved for the trouble they went through. You mean to tell me God will make me go through hell and high water just so someone else can see God in my life so they can get saved? Amen, Amen somebody. Makes you look at trouble a little different, don't it? Makes you look at your trouble a little different, don't you? you mean what I'm going through? You mean my sickness that I'm going through, my trouble, my everybody sees me going through, everybody sees me in trouble right now? And see, the thing is, is that 
Our attitude in trouble says a lot about our relationship with God. In the midst of trouble, Paul and Silas begin to sing praises unto God. What are we doing in the midst of our trouble? Man, God don't love me, man. I hate this, man. I ain't going back to that church. I ain't doing this. I ain't doing that. I ain't serving. I ain't doing nothing. I don't know what's... When trouble comes, the attitude follows. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, when, when the trouble comes, the attitude comes behind it. The I don't want and I don't care and I'm not going to do and I'm not going to serve and I'm not going to give and I'm not going to do this because of the trouble that I'm in. But let me share with you that the trouble that you ever, ever even, even contemplated that maybe the trouble you're in is the good trouble. God has caused you to be in this trouble so somebody can experience God by what you're going through. He put you in trouble to put you in position so you might be able to share with that person. See, see, your, your trouble is really set up. He, he's trying to set you up because he understands that if I can just position you to a place, I, I might be able to get away. Your trouble that you've been through is unique to you. Your experiences. Some of you been through a lot of trouble. Can, can I help somebody? Some of you been through a whole lot of trouble. And you say, well, everything I've been through, why, why did the Lord allow me to do all of that? Because the Lord allowed you to go through all of that, beloved. Not because he didn't love you, but because there was somebody that needed to see the Lord in you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me get, let me get to where I'm at. See, see, see. He wanted to use your trouble as a means to point somebody, to, to save somebody, to show somebody what God can do. You, you know, the prison was a setup because they really didn't do anything wrong, but they were locked in prison. They had been beaten. Their clothes had been torn. They had been shackled in the innermost part of the prison, and they understood the assignment. They started singing and praising and praying. And the Lord showed up. And when the Lord showed up, the Philippian jailer got saved. And not only did he get saved, but his family got saved. You don't know what your trouble will do for someone else. You're thinking God don't love you because you're in trouble. Baby, this is just good trouble. He wants to use your trouble for good trouble. He wants to use your trouble to help somebody else. He wants to use your trouble to help somebody else. He wants to, look, look let, let, me, let me get to, okay, so now I'm in position. I'm in position, and I had to skip to the, I had to get skipped to the end because it, it was hot and you guys were getting, I see the sweat pouring off you. I want to hurry up and get in. So, so, so the purpose, the purpose, the purpose, the purpose, the purpose, the purpose. Your trouble has purpose. Your trouble has purpose. Your trouble has purpose. Your trouble has purpose. That's why it's good trouble, because it has purpose. It has God's purpose on it. That's why it's trouble. That's why it's good trouble. God allows trouble in your life so you might be able to witness to someone else. He puts you in a place. What am I doing here? Why am I here? I shouldn't be here. I'm too good to be here. Have you ever even thought, have you ever even contemplated that God allowed you to fall this far so you could come into contact with somebody who needed to be saved? And that person, because see, you don't know what's going to happen. See, the person being saved, you don't know what kind of influence they're going to have. He says his whole household got saved. The whole house got saved. You know, and I know I've told this story before. There was a, there was a missionary who went to Africa for years. He was unsuccessful. He started small churches, one or two, five, ten. 
He started small churches. He would go back and forth to Africa every year. He was never successful like he thought. He thought God was going to use him to build churches all over the continent. He was going to be this great evangelical leader and lead millions to Christ. And it just didn't pan out like he thought. His ministry, he thought, was a, was a flop. I don't know if I'm talking to somebody. He thought everything he had done for God didn't count for nothing. He had done all his work, done all his praying, sowed all these seeds, and he didn't see anything come up. And he began to be discouraged. And he decided, he decided that he was going to give up his missionary work in Africa. And he said he was going to leave and go back to the States. Years passed. He was in church. A young man came to him. Uh, the young man was, was fairly famous in Africa. He had started churches that had exploded all over the continent. And, and he came to thank the man because he was saved under his ministry. And he told him, he said, you may not have saw, you may not have experienced what you thought, but your ministry through me has exploded. What I want to say to somebody is, is that you never know what kind of influence you're going to have on someone. You, you, you never know why God allowed you to go through this trouble that you're in for maybe just one, you hear me? Just one, just one might be able to go places and do things you have, you never will be able to do, but because they came in contact with you, they were able to do better and greater, but it was all because of you. The Bible does not say uh, what happened to the Phil Phil uh, Philippian jailer and his family, but apparently it was important enough for the Bible to mention that his household was saved, and I'd like to think there was somebody in that household who probably got to... Uh, talk about Jesus to a whole lot of folk. I, I, I don't want to speculate, but there had to be something in that for the Bible to mention that the household got saved. Somebody in that household had to go and talk to somebody else about Jesus. And that somebody talked to somebody else about Jesus. And that somebody else talked to somebody about Jesus. And that somebody else talked about somebody about Jesus. Do you understand the ripple effects of the trouble? The trouble that he was in saved thousands. Beloved, I'm here to tell you, God allows trouble in your life. Trouble will come. Double trouble, 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 triple trouble. Trouble will come in your life. If you live and breathe, trouble will come in your life. You will have trouble. In this life, the Bible says, we will have trouble. Trouble is a natural part of breathing. Trouble will happen. Trouble will come your way. Trouble will knock on your door. Trouble is going to happen to you, if not tomorrow, next week, next year. Some of you are in the midst of trouble right now. You don't know what you're going to do. You don't know how you're going to handle it. Let me tell you, let me sag sagaciously suggest something to you that the trouble that you are in had to pass by God's desk. Let me say this, that before the trouble came to you, somebody had to sign off on the trouble. Some he's in our we are in his hands. Somebody had to sign off and say, "Yeah, this trouble will fit them just right. This trouble will fit." And see, I know I'm not talking, I'm just going to talk to me. Let me talk to me. Can I just preach to me? I know it's hot. I know, look, look, let me just let me just talk to me. The trouble that I'm in now, it had to pass by God's desk. God had to sign off on my trouble. So let me say that if God signed off on my trouble, the trouble has purpose. I want to live in God's purpose, even if it's trouble, because I know if it's trouble, it's good trouble. And the trouble I'm in right now, if it's designed to help somebody along the way that I'm willing to go through trouble that God might use me in my trouble so someone else can see God in me. Yes. 
He wants to use your trouble. He wants to use your trouble. Some of you are saying, why me? Why me? He said, why not you? Why not you? I designed you for this. I commissioned you for this. I built you for this. This trouble ain't, no, ain't unique to you. I've, I, I created you for this. I created you for this trouble. Because in this trouble, there is purpose. I wish you could see it the way I see it. I don't look at trouble anymore like it's just trouble. I look at trouble now and say, okay, Lord, what you up to? What you up to? What you up to? What, you, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to say? How are you going to use this to help somebody else? Your trouble. Your trouble. And, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm done. I'm done. I need to say this to somebody. See, before you were saved, before you were saved, you, you had a lot of experiences. A lot of them were not good. A lot of them were not godly. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this to, to some of y'all. We are the sum total of all our experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We are the sum total of all of those experiences. And let me, let me tell you how awesome our God is. Our God will sustain us, will, will keep us, will watch over us, save us, and then turn around and use everything we've been through to help save someone else. He will use for those of you who've been in trouble in the world, in the streets, he will use your experiences in the streets to pull somebody else out of the street to save them. You understand that? He will, he will use your brokenness, the things you went through as a young man or a young woman. He will use that horrible experience, no matter how horrible it is, he will use that to bring someone into your life who's experiencing the same or similar thing in order to save them. That way your trouble has birth. You're like, Lord, why did you allow me to go through that? He said, because there's somebody coming down the line that's, that's, that's going through what you've been through. And he says, I saved you so you could share your experiences and your time in trouble with them so they could be saved. You have been uniquely commissioned to share the gospel through your own experiences with the world. Hear me when I say that. You have been uniquely commissioned, uniquely shaped, saved. Don't be ashamed of what you've been through. See, the shame keeps you from sharing. And when you don't share, you can't help people come to Jesus. See, 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 we don't share the ugly stuff. We don't, we don't, share, we don't share the ugly stuff with people because we still want people to see us like we are now. And they didn't want to, we don't want them to see us how we were when we was tore up from the floor. And holes, holes and shoes and shirts and car not riding. And, and we, didn't, we, didn't want, we, didn't, we didn't want them to see us broke, busted, and disgusted. We want them to see us polished now. We, wanna, we want them to see us as somebody. So we don't share the ugly parts of our testimony. We don't, we don't share, we don't share the, We, we, we don't share the ugly parts. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to go there. But we don't share the ugly parts. We keep them in the dark. And in the dark, they're not effective. 
your experiences are meant for you to share because it shows somebody, look what God has done. And if God can do it for them, he can do it for me. If I can look at you and you tell me what you went through and God can still bless you, have mercy. If, if, if I could tell my whole testimony, some of you guys, y'all wouldn't want me to be, be your pastor. If I could tell my whole testimony, some of y'all be like, I don't know if he qualified. If you, if you knew the places I've been, the things I've done, the, 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 the words that have come out of my mouth, the, the, the behavior that I have over my young life. My wife, she knows my testimony. And when, she, and when, when I ask her, she says, I know that ain't you, because she said, when I look at you, I can't even see that, dude, you tell me what I used to do. And I share my testimony with people because I want them to know, look what God has done. I, 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 want, I want you to know, look what God has done. And what I want to say to you is that when you share your testimony, there will be somebody to say, look what God has done. 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 I, I mean... That is where we all need to be. God has saved you from a lot. And it's a shame if you don't share that with somebody else. Because there is somebody that needs to hear what you went through. There's somebody that you are in contact with. I'm talking to somebody. There's somebody that you need to minister to. There's somebody that you come in contact with that needs to hear part of your story. And you say, God, why did you put me in this place with this person? He says, because I'm trying to save them because I need them because they're going to do some work and they're going to save some folk that you can't reach. Before I leave, true story, real quick, real, real quick. I, I just need to share, and and I won't. I'll, I'll spare the names. But friends and I, we were sharing um, evangelism. We were doing some radical stuff back at Greater One of Days, riding through parking lots, looking for somebody to pray with. We was doing, you know, church van. Since Judy, you would have loved it. We were just driving, through the park, driving through the projects. We was just looking for somebody to pray with. If, if you look like a thug, we was gonna pull over, try to pray with you. Okay. I'm not exaggerating. We're driving through one. So we're driving through, I'm not even going to say where we were. We were driving through one place. But the, the guy who was leading our evangelism, he, he former gang member, tattooed up, tattooed head down. We wasn't even from Knoxville, tattooed head to toe. Um, he came out of the gang culture, drug culture, um, got saved, full of gifts and graces. The Lord, man, he, boy, he filled that dude up with the Holy Spirit. And I mean, he filled him up good. Um, but we drive through the parking lot, and this dude was walking down. Now, you understand, um, four or five black guys in the church van driving around in the parking lot. And, and this one guy walking down in the parking lot, too. It's almost dark. Uh, we pull up on this, this young white guy, pants hanging down, shaved head. He looked like, he looked like somebody from the neo-Nazis. He's walking through the parking lot, tattooed up. He looks angry, looks mad. The dude says, stop, stop, stop. I, I'm going to get out and talk to him. I'm like, no. <laughs> says why? I, look, look. No, nah, we're gonna keep on going. He said, no, 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 I'm gonna get out and talk to him. So he, so he got out and talked to him. He got out and talked to him. He stopped the dude in the parking lot while everybody's around. Him and that guy started praying. Both of them lifting hands up to the Lord. It changed the whole atmosphere of the van. It changed the whole atmosphere of the parking lot. I mean, he didn't fit, and he didn't fit. I want you to get what I'm saying. He didn't fit, he didn't fit. He didn't, they didn't look like they went together. But he was full of tattoos, gang culture. This other dude looked like he was full of tattoos, gang culture. Different demographic, white, black, young, old. He was able to touch him in such a way that this young man started coming to church. 
what, what I'm trying to say to you is that God has gifted each of us with unique gifts to reach those who've had similar experiences to us so we might be able to share the gospel with them. There's somebody out there with your name on them that you, will, you are called to share. My assignment to you is before I close this message is to pray and ask God to put this person in your path, in your life, so that you might be able to share. And the trouble you've been through is so you can share the gospel with this person. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I praise your name for this opportunity. Thank you for good trouble. Thank you for good trouble. Thank you for allowing trouble in my life. I understand now that trouble has purpose. Trouble was meant as a means to share the gospel with other people. Lord, I pray now that you would touch the hearts of your people here today. That they will look for good trouble. That they will look to get in good trouble. That they might share with other people the good news. Father, thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Thank you for changed minds. Thank you for changed hearts. Thank you for pricking them in such a way that they want to be used by you. And that they'll look at their trouble in a different way. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, y'all.